Hey everybody, Joshua Lewis here with The Remnant Radio. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. We're going to be talking about Assemblies of God Theology. I've got Pastor Anthony uh, Skoma on the other line. We're going to be discussing the history, theological distinctives uh, of the Assemblies of God. But before we dive into that subject, I want to let you know a little bit about Remnant Radio. Uh, Remnant Radio is a theology program. We stream every Monday night at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time and every Tuesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, our, our goal in this show is to interview pastors and teachers outside of our theological denominations uh, and to really challenge our our, our theological presuppositions. Uh, So we interview Lutherans and Presbyterians and Baptists and Pentecostals, and the whole goal the entire time is to kind of suspend our presuppositions and study God's Word together. If that's something that you're you're interested in doing, uh, learning lots of theological perspectives, make sure to hit the subscribe button as we're coming out with content just like this every single week. I typically turn it over to Michael, who is my co-host here. Uh, he told me to make a really good excuse for him in the first try of this video that was interrupted because of streaming. Uh, uh, I said that he was building orphanages in Papua New Guinea, but I'll actually say today he's signing his new apostolic reformation papers. He is re-signing his annual membership. <laughs> that's not true. Uh, that's just a, a little joke from the last episode of NAR that we've done. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, he is not going to be with us this week, unfortunately, so I'll be running the whole show myself. I will be in the comment section, so if you're asking questions, I will try try to get to them to the best of my ability, but it's a it's a one-man show this week, so I apologize for that. Uh, if you want to support the ministry, I'd really encourage, uh, go to our Patreon. The link is in the description of this video. Uh, you see those videos that come up. Uh, the one on the far left is us in Aspen hanging out uh, at, at a church up there, me and Michael Miller. Uh, it's kind of an interview that we haven't published publicly. Uh, there is an interview with uh, uh, Elijah Stevens, who came on just last week, talking about discerning, discernment ministries. And the one on the far right, me and Michael are talking about uh, our personal stories, our ministries, uh, kind of our testimony. Uh, if you want to learn some of that stuff, go check us out on Patreon. Link is in the description. Uh, it's as low as five bucks a month. Help support us as a ministry. I uh, apologize for those of you who were watching just earlier and we got interrupted with the stream. Uh, will not happen again as we changed our stream settings. Uh, uh, but I've got Pastor Anthony Skoma on the other line. Tell us about yourself and your ministry before we dive into the subject, if you would. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. And I think it's fantastic that you're excited about a, an episode on the Simmons Got History because even my Simmons Got Friends aren't excited about an episode on the Simmons <laughs> Got History. But we'll have we'll have fun with it. Um, as I think you mentioned, you grew up uh, AG. I I did That's too. Right. I'm actually um, fourth generation Assemblies of God on both sides of my family, which is saying something for denominations only 100 years old. So uh, and um, it's actually. North Texas district. The assembly's got is structured that way. And, and I'm in North Texas the same way that you are right now. And uh, so grew up in the AG of my life, but never had any thoughts of ministry. I wanted to be a lawyer since I was eight years old, used to watch 2020 and get outraged by injustice. And so I went to the university of Texas at Austin to pursue that goal and uh, was involved in a group called Chi Alpha Christian fellowship. It's an assemblies of God campus ministry that they're all over the country, all over the world, really. And um, about halfway through my time at UT, got a, a, a radical calling. It's something we do in Pentecost. You know, God calls us, speaks to us. And so I had this radical calling experience that uh, God to, to go into full-time vocational ministry. I don't know what to do with that. I'm at UT. And I talked to my campus pastor. And he said, well, now you graduate, you get your degree, and, uh, and you go to seminary. And I said, all right, what's that? And yeah, it's graduate school for ministry. And I said, okay, where did you go? And he had gone to the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary in Springfield, Missouri. It's the headquarters city. So that's where I'm going. Didn't even look at another one. And so uh, graduated from UT with a degree in history, got married two weeks later, moved to Springfield, Missouri two weeks later, sight unseen. Uh, got a master's of divinity there uh, with the Pentecostals. And then um, uh, felt a call later. I was on staff at a church in Missouri and felt a call to church planting. And so they mothered us to come down to uh, Austin, Texas, where I am now. And I wanted to come back. And, uh, and, and start a church to reach people that either didn't have faith or left it when they were young, the people that I kind of went to school with. And uh, we did that. So 17 years ago, we planted Southwest Family Fellowship here in, in uh, Austin, Texas, and uh, have been reaching uh, that demographic ever since and having a great time doing it. It's a unique city. I, I love it. It's, it's a difficult city to church plant in, but uh, do that. And then um, a few years ago, felt like I wanted to retool and wound up going to Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary uh, to uh, get a master's in divinity in historical theology. Um, I love history and theology. And uh, like I said, the Assemblies of God, we're only 100 years old. We don't have any history. But uh, (laughs) mainline Presbyterians, they're rock stars in it. So uh, I did that. So I like to say now I've I've got a degree 
uh, from the mainline uh, church, the Pentecostal church and Secular University. So I'm, I'm fluent in in uh, Presbyterianism, Pentecostalism and paganism. So <laughs> you're a, you're also a, a presbyter, right? So so that means that you're like the bishop or a bishop in the Assemblies of God, right? Right. Maybe uh, <laughs> maybe a bishop in the. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like so I did that intentionally. I, I your face of fear. Churches like... of this area. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, man, I'm really excited. So we're talking about the history of the assemblies. I think the reason I'm so excited about this is um, there's just not really entertaining stuff on the internet about the history of uh, uh, the assemblies. I mean, there's like really interesting stuff about Azusa, and there's some kind of like fringe things and like, oh yeah, Azusa was this really big, awesome thing that happened. And you know, the assemblies kind of, you know, formed after that, you know? So can you, yeah, can you maybe yeah. like set up the, the tone for us as we discuss uh, the history of the assemblies, uh, how, how the kind of origin stories come out of Azusa Street, and then we'll kind of, we'll hang out in, in some of the, the kind of really early proto classical Pentecostal area uh, before we, before we I guess, kind of get into the nuts and bolts of it all. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, of course, the first thing we've got to say is, is, is Pentecost is very broad. It would be, um, I would no longer say that the, uh, the the Presbyterian Church USA represents all reform you know movements in the country. No, you can't say that. There's a bunch of different uh, groups. So you got a Pentecostal uh, umbrella, um, really born in 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 America. It's a unique dynamic. I, I don't remember who I read this. Somebody one time said there's only two branches of Christianity that were formed by uh, founded by non non Western Europeans, and uh, one is Pentecostalism. And one is Christianity. And so uh, uh, however you want to talk about the foundations of Pentecostalism, and, and there were inroads to that coming globally. More and more we understand that there were proto-Pentecostal revivals happening in, in, in India and in Latin America and different places. Pentecostalism. Uh, our mythos is, uh, goes back to uh, January 1st, 1901, when Agnes Osmond became the first person on this continent known to to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled her, a glossolalia. And uh, our, our story behind that is in Topeka, Kansas, Charles Parham. I know you've talked about Parham on this program before. Uh, he was leading this, this uh, college. And the story is that uh, the students were reading the book of Acts and, uh, and, and came to this baptism of the Holy Spirit and said, what would be the sign uh, that, that you were baptized in the Spirit? And they all came to the same conclusion that it would be speaking in tongues. And they said, how come we don't do that anymore? So they began to pray and seek it. And lo, there they were. And uh, so Charles Parham took that show on the road and began to, uh, to teach and preach around the, uh, the Midwest and the South, wound up in Houston, Texas, and uh, teaching there when a, um, uh, a young itinerant, partially blind black man named uh, William Seymour, uh, son of slaves, or is it, was it son? Yeah, and, uh, grandson or grandson, um, came under his teaching, uh, Parham sympathize with the Ku Klux Klan. All right. So let's, let's mm -hmm. call what it is, what it is. Um, but he kind of paternalistically allowed Seymour to sit outside of his classroom uh, while he was teaching and kind of listen in through the open door. So Seymour got his Pentecostal theology from Parham, went out to California, started the, uh, what would become the Azusa Street Mission, which became this huge revival. Uh, Parham later went out and tried to take it over. Uh, you know, he saw the success having and, and went out there, and when it was clear that wasn't going to happen, um, he turned against his pupil and uh, and really said things and some really racist things about what was going on at Azusa Street, which we now all think is beautiful and and in and, and the point. Um, I know you're going to have Amos Young on in, in mm -hmm. a few uh, episodes here coming up, and you ought to talk to him about Pentecost and uh, uh, the diversity of, of Acts chapter 2 and, and God there reversing the curse of Babel. It's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that the, yeah, the Jews understood the Feast of Pentecost, uh, 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 Shavuot, as as a, a story of of the reverse of the Babel story. It, it had a part of that. Babel goes right to law, and that's all connected in in, uh, in in rabbinic Judaism. And so on the day of Pentecost, you know, on, on Babel, everybody tried to get together with one tongue to overthrow God, and God said, "We're not having that." So He gave them this diversity of tongues. Um, which is kind of shows that all the empirical dynamics and oppression that comes from that comes from um, man's trying to unify, you know, and, and, and come against God. But what's interesting on the day of Pentecost is he gave him this common tongue, what we would call glossolalia, but he did not 
restore their uh, unified national tongues. And this time, that common tongue, they were all praising God, the, 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 the megolia, the mega, mega deeds. Of and Young says that's a picture that God loves diversity, that many tongues, many practices, that God is all for the diversity of nations and peoples and all those things. And then when Peter gets up and explains all that from Joel chapter two, he mentions uh, your, your, your men and your women. So there's a, a gender dynamic. He says your Jews and Gentiles, there's an ethnic dynamic. There's the slaves and the masters. And so there's this economic dynamic to it. And it's really a beautiful picture. That's what Azusa was. Um, but it was also very like early America, very independent. You're not going to tell me what to do. All these different splinter groups and what happened was people would go back with this experience of the Holy Spirit and all kinds of Christians. I mean, bishops, uh, white Catholic bishops went to uh, uh, Azusa, Methodist, mainline churches, Hispanic farm workers, all these kind of people went to Azusa. And then they would go back to their mainline churches and go, guess what happened to me? And those churches would say, no, thanks. Not here. There's mm -hmm. the door. And and so they were kind of out and you would have all these little independent congregations. And, and so many of them had been so burned by their denominations that they were determined not to have a denomination. I've got one quote. It's out of one of the early Pentecostal magazines. And and they said, we will not uh, shackle ourselves to the bonds of denominationalism ever again. That's what they saw. It really is like slavery. So this went on for a, a few years, but then a few of these independent Pentecostal churches started saying, you know what, there are some things we could do better together. Uh, specifically, one is uh, uh, Pentecostal education. We could yeah. run some schools together, and, and that is wound up happening. Um, publishing. We need to publish this. Back in the day, there was no internet. It was the printing press, and we need to start publishing some some uh, books and pamphlets and things about this, this Pentecostal uh, witness. So, so publishing education. The third was accountability of ministers, specifically the accountabilities of funds because they were having happen. What happens in a lot of, I don't want to demonize independent churches, but when there's no accountability, sometimes the pastors can take the money and do whatever they want to do. And there were just some problems. And so they said, we need some accountability of, of, of ministers. And then the fourth one was, was a missions push. It was from the beginning it was a global missions uh, push from from Azusa all over the world, you know, and we, we could do that better if we got together and did it together. So a bunch of these cats got together in 1914 in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and uh, decided to get together and form not a denomination. Oh, boy, they didn't know. No, no a, 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 a cooperative <laughs> fellowship, even in the as as it got today. We are a cooperative fellowship, brothers. We're not a denomination. Well, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and, and <laughs> this thing's a duck. If it, could, if it looks like a duck, quacks they like a duck, not, and can take your ordination papers, it's a denomination. And can take your ordination <laughs> papers and charge you 350 bucks a year for uh, your dues. Yeah, it's it's a duck. That's so, a duck. Um, but they did not want any creedal nonsense no statement of belief nope we're getting together it's a loose affiliation of churches to do this thing so they came together in 1914 and formed the assemblies of god um i have a quote here in fact i, I wanted to get this one because I, I i pulled this up but um this is in one of the early um it's the christian evangel we have a magazine called the pentecostal evangel that's been around forever and it was the christian evangel before that and a bunch of other independent pentecostal magazines kind of came together but J. Roswell Flower, one of the founding fathers, all right, he wrote a lot of the stuff and was one of our early leaders. And, and he said this, there was a lot of fear about this thing coming together and a lot of conspiracy theories. And somebody's going to, so here's what he said, just before this great meeting took place, this is 1914 uh, founding meeting in Hot Springs, Arkansas. It was whispered around that a man-made creed was about to be formed to be forced down the throats of all freedom-loving Pentecostal people. I and mean, that's a statement right there that a strong centralized church government contrary to the word of God was about to be formed that some man was to be elected head of the church right I Pope and thus usurp the place of Christ that a charter was to be obtained to preach the gospel according to the creed to be formed 
and that every man who did not adopt the one name, the one creed, hold for the new pope, he actually puts it in quotes, that man would be summarily disfellowshipped and driven out of the Pentecostal camp. So these alarms caused great fears in the God-fearing and liberty-loving people. That was the attitude going in to, uh, to 1914. And so I think that we, statement, God-fearing and liberty-loving, that's a key deal. So um, th these were not just a bunch of, I mean, I think there's this this kind of perspective of uh, early Pentecostalism that is like, you know, oh boy, we got our theology. We don't need none of that theology. We got we got the ghost. But but isn't there like a bunch of backstory of like the the kind of mainline denominations throwing theological bombs at these guys um, and kind of beating them up yeah. and then having a disposition towards theology because they viewed the academics as the ones who were attacking them for what they were doing. Um, so so uh, uh, we had a, a, an interview. Um, by or with with uh, man, what was it? Doug, uh, Doug Weaver, uh, Doctor Doug Weaver from Baylor. He came on the show and he wrote a book called Baptists and the Holy Spirit. And he was just talking about how uh, the group of uh, of Pentecostals was birthed kind of into anti intellectualism because the mainline denominations had kind of done nothing. They didn't try to come in and like correct and guide and help. All they wanted to do was like throw theological rocks at them. Uh, so they, they were kind of postured as anti-intellectual. Can you kind of speak into that? Was that, is yes. that an accurate uh, assessment of what was happening? Is this anti-theology thing a response to <laughs> abusive theology? It, 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 it. In one way, yes, they were abused by that. They had been kicked out of the denominations and were seen as not taken seriously in their in their theology. From the beginning, a, a, a slight against Pentecostals has always been that they are an experience in search of a theology. Mm -hmm. That's why, by the way, the myth of Topeka Bible College is always, on our ordination tests, there is a true false question. I'm, I'm the president, I give these tests. And the question says, um, the uh, students at Topeka Bible College in 1901 began speaking in tongues and then went to Acts chapter two and found the text. Now, the answer to that question is false. And we right. put that on our nation desk because we want you to know, no, they found the theology first and then they had the experience. Mm -hmm. I'm 100% sure they did, but that's our myth. And, <laughs> and so we're sensitive to that, that we have this experience and are looking for theology. But the reality is they were an experiential people. They didn't want the uh, 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 Tomlinson, the founder of the Church of God, uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, um, another Pentecostal nomination. Here's this great quote where he says, this thing that I'm about to give you, it's coming to you firsthand through the Holy Spirit, not secondhand through any other men. I didn't get this from a commentary. I didn't get this from a Bible college. This is firsthand from God via the Holy Spirit. So they did have that denomination, that that, that denominational dynamic that they, they didn't want seminaries, creeds, statements of faith. They just wanted to hear from God. I mean, really, these were a mystical... Uh, people that that wanted to hear directly from God, but they weren't educated. Um, very, very few uh, had educations. So, um, so what happened? Because like we've got we've got like a sixteen fundamentals. We've got uh, we've got a yes. theological statement in the assemblies. How did they go from, you know, the popish demon and the the <laughs> single creed and like these kinds of demonizing of higher thinking to? holding uh, theological statements and having leaders of the denomination that have got masters and doctorates and uh, that are really committed to theology. H how did they go from there to here? Like every other group in the history of the church does, that you start off with what you're for, mm -hmm. and then you realize, oh, but those guys, we don't like what they are, so we need <laughs> to start saying kind of what we're not, right, not just right. what we're for. I mean, isn't that how Nicaea happened? You yeah. know, isn't that how all the creeds of the church, we would go, okay, this is fine. And then somebody would come along and say, yeah, but we think the son was, you know, birthed separately from the father. No, 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 no. You can't do that. Let's have another council. Okay. But we think the Holy Spirit, you know, generated from the father and the son. At, no, 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 no. That's feel like, okay. We got to have another conference. Same thing. So here's what happens. Remember, these are people that are all about the experience and, and, and part of this is one of the interesting things about Pentecostals, there's a tension here. And a, a guy named Grant Wacker, a, a church historian at Duke, great guy, wrote a great book called Heaven Below, Heaven Beneath. Um, it's a history of, of, of Pentecostalism 
not from a, a, a denominational structure for most histories are like, and then the leadership did this and the leadership did this. He's writing about common people and their writings and what they were feeling. And, and so he says in there that kind of the genius uh, and the curse is, is this tension between what he calls the primitive streak and the pragmatic streak. So the primitive streak is we want to get as close to the restoration of acts as we can get. We want the thumbprint of God on us and we don't want a lot of man's fingerprints in between. We want to go right back to the source. We want to be the next chapter of acts. Um, but when you do that, this is true of any reform movement. This is why I have found in, in the Presbyterian camp, they're just as schismatic as the Pentecostal camp is. Why? Because they're reform people. And when you're a reform person that wants to get back to the pure the sources, reform, yeah. Yeah. Well, my reform's a little purer than your reform. And then this guy says, well, my reform's purer than your reform. And right. how do you argue with that? So you splinter and you splinter. So th this, in, in, in 1913, uh, no, 10, I'm getting my dates, 11 or 12. Okay. There was a there was a, a holiness um, uh, healing revival in in Los Angeles, very near where Dodger Stadium is now. Okay, Arroyo Soap, and uh, this lady is, is is preaching, and so many people start getting saved that they decide to have a baptismal service. Mm -hmm. So they ask this Canadian um, uh, revivalist to get up and just talk about baptism, and he does, and he's just doing a, a biblical teaching on baptism, and he says, "By the way, um, we have no indication." that any of the apostles ever baptized anybody by the formula that Jesus gave us, you know, in his great commission of, and baptized them in the name of the father, the son, the Holy spirit. He's kind of said that as an aside. And, and someone wrote that a great, a great shudder went through the, the pastors on the stage. And uh, so this one guy and his, his name is known to us only for this one thing he's lost to us in history, but he stays up all night worried about this, praying about this, seeking the scriptures about this. And in the middle of the night, God gives him a revelation. And in the wee hours of the morning, he gets up running through this camp. There are people camping out at this revival service. Another thousand people come at night for the services, but there's a thousand people camping on the grounds. And he runs out and, and he starts to, to say, I've got this revelation in Jesus name. There's power in Jesus name and in Jesus name only. And, uh, and, and, and that's the thing. And so, he gets up the next day and he gives this testimony. Pentecostals are huge on testimonies. And so he gives this testimony of what has, has happened. And one of the men that's listening, a guy named Frank Ewart, is a uh, uh, Australian a Baptist missionary. He's very outspoken. He got kicked out of the Baptist, got kicked out of Australia. He's come to America. He's uh, Now he's in, in, in Canada and he's doing these things. And he takes this up and spends the next year studying this. Uh He'd received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1908, and this is like 1910, 1911. He takes one whole year and studies this issue and comes to the understanding that, no, it's not appropriate to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You can only be baptized in Jesus' name because that's the only baptism we actually see in Scripture. And Pentecostals are very big on if it's not in Scripture, you don't, you don't do it. it. It's just the Bible. Even in seminary, in my seminary, we were real big on biblical theology, real big on I had great classes on Corinthians and Luke and, you know, but we didn't do systematic theology super well. We sure didn't do historical theology. Uh, that's, that's popish. So, <laughs> the, right. So this guy, Frank Ewer starts going around and, and he begins to teach this. And he and another guy uh, named Cook wind up getting uh, rebaptized in Jesus name because their old baptism was, so they start going around and teaching this, and it starts picking up and lighting fire among these new Pentecostals. They're going all over the Midwest, all over the thing. And, and people start going, oh, yeah, my baptism wasn't good enough. I got to get now uh, rebaptized. Now, here's what I think, to be honest. These are a whole group of people that just discovered the baptism in the Holy Spirit as a second work that really hadn't been on the scene for thousands of years. So these were people who were already in the mindset of forget tradition. I'll buck all that. I want to hear right from the Holy Spirit right now. In a few years, the Spirit told us to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We're speaking in tongues. And now we feel like the Holy Spirit is telling us to be rebaptized in water in Jesus' name only. 
so it became very divisive. These guys, um, Cook winds up coming to uh, U.S. partner to uh, Springfield, Missouri. I'm sorry, uh, St. Louis, Missouri. We weren't in Springfield yet. The headquarters was in in in, uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, right after 1914. So, so either late 1914. Yep. You've got the reincarnation of Arius on the scene, who is. <laughs> we haven't yes. got there yet, right? So we like, got I, there, but that's exactly I know. What's happening. I know the Jesus only, because that's what they're called. They're called Jesus only Pentecostals or oneness Pentecostals or UPC. And this is a really or important new thing. Yep. Yeah. For those, for those who, who are watching right now and they're like, I have heard that Pentecostals believe you have to speak in tongues to be saved. I've heard that Pentecostals deny the Trinity. I've heard that the Pentecostals, what they're talking about, they're talking about the United Pentecostal Church, not the classical Pentecostal denominations, such as right. the Assemblies of God and the Church of God. So so we're going to get to that section right here, but it's important that we kind of just, ah, this is the first schism, if you will, first of the Pentecostal schism. Church, where they go, first hey. First schism. <laughs> so so, so takes, unpack this schism. It keeps going. Yes. So the Assemblies it doesn't stop of God at baptism. New. No. In yeah. 1914, it's been formed. And just a few months later, these guys come in and start speaking this, this, this rebaptism thing. Yeah. And so, okay, there's 12 executive presbyters. All right. These are the uh the the, the founding fathers of the Assemblies of God. Well, that's, that's day, not important. Still the big wings. Okay. Okay. Like six of these guys sign up for Jesus only, right? Oh damn. And uh we we have 12 Assemblies of God ministers in Louisiana. All mm -hmm. 12 of them go in for this. So it is spreading fast. And so in 1915, they have a second council actually it's a third council but remember 1914 they had the first thing to set it up but no statement of faith so 1915 they get together and there's this young guy jay roswell flower I already mentioned him uh jay roswell flower and ian bell and now bell was an interesting cat he's, he's from texas and he was a former baptist and, and 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 a lot of the early pentecostals came out of the holiness uh methodist roots and uh and some of them had some anabaptist roots like uh, uh like like almost quakerism type stuff mystical stuff not ian bell he was a texas like southern baptist to the core no women in ministry no you know all those things um but he was he was educated he he had a, a college degree he had a bible degree and he knew his stuff so he knew that this stuff was a, a rehash he even has this quote uh in the uh, earliest summers he got magazine where he says these guys this is not new folks they are rehashing old heresies that they don't understand. But he mentions Arianism. And, and he says, this is just Arianism reborn. And he's educated enough to know it. And so he and J. Ross take this thing on. And, uh, and so they go and have this meeting in, in, uh, uh, in, 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 in 1915. Mm -hmm. And it's like, a, let's, let's make peace. Let, let, let's have peace. We're not going to have a creed, but let's, we're not going to tell anybody what they have to believe. But um, let's let's just make room. Can't we all just get along? Mm -hmm. And so they leave that council thinking we're going to make room for both. But the peace doesn't last. I mean, they start getting very quickly where uh, they're calling each other out. It goes from believing that um, there's a new Jesus only baptism to believing Trinitarian is, is wrong. And they begin to go, Trinity's not in the Bible. This is it's what now? The Nicene what? Creed? Creeds? We, we don't like creeds. That sounds Catholic. And so like, no, we're not. And, and so it became that you can't be even saved. I, I want to read you a quote. So this is where this fight got. So here's a guy. And, and, and so remember I said that guy, Ewart, who was the first yeah. one to really get the Jesus only theology. He began to write this magazine called uh, a Meet and Do Season. Still a propagator of this Jesus only movement. And so he, there was a, a, a guy named Bartleman who was a, a famous um, early AG adopter, converted over to Jesus only. And so they were really crowing about uh, this, this, this dynamic and, and, and telling his story, his testimony. And he's saying, you know, it's really sad, guys. Uh, he says, many shun, inclined to want to hurt them. So my former AG friends have shunned me now for this, this Jesus only doctrine as if I was trying to hurt them, right? But then he says this. This is a direct quote. He says, uh, which side are we on? There must be a final complete separation. The name of Christ or the mark of the Antichrist. This is where this guy's going. If you're a Trinitarian, it's not just that you're a different view than us. 
you're taking the mark of the Antichrist. He so says, the people- line wasn't even drawn by the Orthodox Charismatics. The line was drawn by the Aryan Pentecostals who were That's like, right. uh, oh, no, 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 it's us or nothing. It, the, yes. the inclusiveness of the Pentecostal denomination wasn't like, hey, we're going to pick this fight because you're, you're going into error. It was the error that was like us or nothing. Yeah, the Orthodox people said, we're going to make room. So like, like said, in the Nicaea, no, 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 no. Like in Nicaea, it was the opposite, right? Like the group of guys right. get together and they're like, hey, there's this Arius guy. He's singing all this worship stuff and his, his music is catching wind. Uh, everybody's singing his songs and they're like really confusing. Yeah. And then they show up and then you have St. Nicholas who gets ticked off and punches Arius in the face at the Council of Nicaea. I was waiting yes. for the, the Pentecostal. The face. That's it. Yes, I was just waiting for the the Pentecostal incarnation of, of Santa Claus to knock one of these guys out. I was really excited for right. that, but doesn't happen right. it doesn't seem so it so doesn't. the opposite role is the one who's being exclusive here right interesting so j roswell flower and, and here's the crazy thing so after this happens in this council and they go ian bell one of the stalwarts yeah he he leaves and he goes to this uh revival service uh somewhere and and one night they give him down and be rebaptized in the name of jesus that's it and they're like what Ian Bell, he was the he was the man. And he explained it later was, and this is you gotta understand Pentecostal's hearts. He wasn't primarily thinking about a theological structure. Right. He just had been feeling dry, probably had been burnt out. Now we would say, if you looked at his schedule, this guy was building a denomination and trying to do a printing press and traveling all over back and forth. He didn't have airplanes back then, and he was probably just burnt out. And he was feeling like his preaching wasn't as inspired. He just felt like he needed a fresh word from God. And he felt like God spoke to him and said, if you don't go get baptized in the name of Jesus, uh, I'm not going to bless your ministry anymore. And, and that's the pragmatism of Pentecost. Mm-hmm. So there's a primitivism. There's this pragmatism. We're just going to do what's going to get it done. And so he goes up and gets rebaptized into this budding heresy. So J. Roswell Flowers back home, he's 27 years old. He goes, nope, I got to take care of this. So he kind of connives. It's a, it's a It's a Michael Corleone deal. He's like, gets all the heads of the families together, but he's putting his guys <laughs> here and there and, uh, and, and, and arranges this, <clears throat> this, this other meeting in, um, in, in 1918, I'm sorry, 1916 in St. Louis. So 1914, we're founded 1915. We have a conference going, Hey, let's, this all get along. Doesn't work. So in 1916, they come together in St. Louis and go, okay, we need to lay out some guidelines. And it becomes this fight over uh, a creed. And what emerges are what we call now the 16 fundamental truths. But if you ever look at it, it's very interesting. If you go look at our state, go to ag.org and you can look at it. The wording, like 60% of the written word is all under one of those truths. And it's the one yep. about Trinitarianism. Yep. The only reason we had it, we did not have a council to figure out the doctrine of tongues. Nope. We had it to figure out Trinitarianism versus an Arian or Sabalian. I, I, I see both Arianism and Sabalianism with the two great enemies of Nicaea. Uh, is there a fusion element, you know, the modalism right. that God is just, or, or a distancing element in the Arianism? You had both of those factions. And, and, and I kept calling it Arianism. It, it is, it is modalism, isn't it? Cause it's, it's it uh, Jesus only is modalism. It isn't, Arianism yes. is that Christ is created. They wouldn't. They wouldn't hold that Christ was a created being, would they? They would say, "I must have." I kept saying Arianism because I was thinking of Nicaea, but uh, yeah. it would have been modal, more modalistic, wouldn't it? It was more modalistic in its nature. Arian elements did creep into it. Like but today, mostly it was the, the titles, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, were all uh, were, were were titles for the same being that Jesus. Yeah. So the idea is that there's power in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Like. Jesus, right? That's the name. That's who he is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are are descriptors, uh, titles, descripting yeah. titles, which are very yeah. modalistic. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, so I don't know why I kept saying Arius because I was probably thinking of the Nicene Creed. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the the modalistic presentation of the oneness guys is not that there isn't a Father or that there isn't a Spirit, um, but that that uh, he puts on his Father hat, he puts on his Son hat, he puts on his Holy Spirit hat. Yes. But but you you said that there was there were views of Arianism that kind of creeped in there. Maybe explain that to me. Okay, I'd have to give you my whole dissertation. I don't have to give you the whole dissertation. Dang. I give you in a, in a, 
in a lump shoot, sum. Just shoot every- me a link. I'll put it in the description for the nerds. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that later. But it, it, it all has to do with the balancing of, of a relational distancing and fusion and self-differentiation in the middle, that Nicene mm. creedal theology is, uh, is a balance, that the spirit is three in one, is a, is a, uh, a moment of differentiation. And that whenever, it's, my view is that the, when God says, make us in his image, that the Imago Day is actually that three in one dynamic that makes the Godhead the Godhead, that makes uh, God a relational power, be- a relational presence before a power presence. And, and it's interesting to me that throughout church history, whenever you see big church fights and schisms, it's almost always over the nature of and the three in one. And so you see Arianism yeah. on one side and Sabellianism on the other side as, as, as two factions pulling against this this differentiation. Which rightfully um, slow. If we're going to split, so, let's split over the nature of God, right? Exactly. And you see it You see it at the split over the church east and west, the filial case split. Uh, you see it in the Middle Ages. Everything uh, in the Reformation, everything John Calvin wrote in his institutions about the Holy Spirit was in, um, in, in, in reply to a man named Michael Servetus, the great heretic who had written against the Nicene Creed. Yeah. Uh, even in the modern liberal period, Schleiermacher put the Trinity at the end of his uh, uh, th- 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 his um, theology and Karl Barth famously put the Trinity at the very beginning of his. Everything was Trinitarian, so you have these divides all through history, and you have the same thing in Pentecost. And, and this is this interesting because you, what, you're, what you're saying is like even in every Reformation, like in the Protestant yes. Reformation that came up, there was this desire to go back to the sources in such a way that there were Protestants who were like, "Hey, forget the creeds; we don't need them." And then Luther and Calvin were like. No, 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 no. Too far, too far, too far, too far, too far. And like, uh, and the Pentecostals did the exact same thing. Where uh, this is my so point. The, it's crazy. The early 20th century uneducated Pentecostals were were acting out Nicaea and the filioque debate between East and West, and the, they didn't even know it. They didn't yeah. have the church history, but there's something deeply theological about it. So anyway, they go and the oneness faction thinks they're going to, you know, they're going to fight this and they get there and J. Roswell Flower has stacked the deck. He's made sure to put Trinitarian guys in all the positions of power, controlling all the committees. Nice. So they basically go in and ramrod this thing. And the oneness guys start realizing we're not going to get it. So they sit together and begin to vote as a block against everything. No, no, no. So they start. They filibustered it. Exactly. Are we in favor of the virgin birth? No. Yeah, it's just they're gonna deny everything. <laughs> so they see, okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna win. And so it passes and they all go shake hands. And a full quarter of the Assemblies of God ministers that had formed two years before in or in 1914 walk out. So and this is almost like six- the robber council. Like where they literally stuck because that happened in Nicaea yeah. too, right? Like proto Nicaea, they they have this like uh uh yeah. The, the creed two and a half or three and a half or whatever, where they like, they stacked the deck with guys that only agreed with them. that were only bishops yep. from their side. Um, and then, and then uh, they called in uh, uh, Constantine and he was like, Hey, 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 like you gotta, you gotta have a, like a more balanced group of de- And then they still decided almost a similar thing. This is hilarious though. The assemblies did the exact Jay same Roswell thing. Roswell flower was our Gregor of Nyssa. He was just, he was playing, he was like, I'll be the chairman. I'm going to, you know, but I'm doing it. So, yeah, <laughs> That's gold. It's fascinating to me. And they, <laughs> they had no way of knowing it. I mean, they, they yeah. just didn't know it. We know they didn't know it. Um, so it, it, they left. And, and six months later, they all got together in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, the guys that left, the oneness guys. And, and almost all of the ministers that got kicked out gathered in Eureka Springs and formed a new apostolic something assembly. It's very close to Assemblies of God, but it's a different. And that was the first oneness or Jesus only denomination. Uh, and they continue to kind of splinter from there. And we're still not friends. It, um, we're getting close to time. I'm, this is a fun no, story. In 19, we're actually, um, we're good. We, we, we can go okay. a little bit longer if you're, if you're good. Yeah. In 1999, I went to the uh, Society of Pentecostal Studies uh, meeting was in, in Springfield, Missouri. And one night they were having a screening of a new movie um, by Robert Duvall called The Apostle. I don't know if you see it. It's a small yeah. film, but he takes Pentecost very seriously. And they, they were loving it because some of the old timey Pentecostal guys were in the film. He would have them as extras and, and things. And the basic story is here's a Texas preacher, a uh, Pentecostal preacher who you know, loses kind of his way, hits his youth pastor with a bat because he's 
messing with his wife or something and and and, and i think he kills him and he runs off into hiding in louisiana oh my and he god has this moment. yeah oh, it's amazing it sounds like and a- bobby duvall was nominated for best actor for this and so uh he, he, he gets right with God and he decides he's going to start a church again, but he's out there on his own in the swamps, Louisiana, and he, and he makes his decision for God and he goes in the swamp and he baptizes himself. And, and he says, he gets up and he says, I baptize myself in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he goes down and he comes up and he goes, and in the name of Jesus, and he baptizes himself, comes back up. When he did that, I am sitting in a room of the biggest, nerdiest, egghead, Pentecostal, uh, theologians from all kinds of different denominations, they break out laughing like it's the latest Eddie Murphy comedy of the day. I mean, it was just hilarious. <laughs> and I didn't get it. The point was he baptized himself in both, in mm-hmm. the name of the Father, the Holy Spirit, and in Jesus. He was recognizing that you can't make a Pentecostal movie without showing both of these dynamics. Right, and they just right. Thought it was and so... <laughs> A year after Nerds. that, SBS sponsored a dialogue between oneness and Trinitarian Pentecostals. And I think we understand each other a little bit, but we didn't get anywhere near. No. Our superintendent, the Assemblies of God, said, well, they're like Mormons. They're nice people, but their theology makes us unable to cooperate with them in any way. Yeah. That's where we are today with the Trinitarian versus the oneness. So in, in there, are, there are a couple people in the comment sections. We've done lots of videos on this uh, with the early church and with some— uh, so we've done episodes on Nicaea, we've done uh, on, on, on the Chalcedonian Creed, those kinds of things. Uh, so so j- for those of you who are not really familiar with some of the dialogue, um, in the early church, there were a couple of uh, outliers, uh, such as Sibelius, uh, or Sibelianism or modalism, uh, saying the different uh, God is one person and puts on three different hats. Uh, then there was another view of Arianism, that the Christ uh, and oftentimes Christ in the Spirit were, were forces or beings that were created and emanate from God. Uh, but not are not are themselves of the same essence as God, the greatest first, the greatest creator of of God's creation, uh, but not God Himself. Uh, so, so both of those views would be heresy uh, by its its most traditional uh, definition. So, just kind of catch everybody up as we're talking about modalism and Arianism and talking about uh, uh, this kind of new birth of Nicaea, this new birth of the Protestant Reformation that took place uh, after Azusa with the assemblies. So, uh, and I would I would. Uh, I would affirm that, you know, people who would deny the Trinity uh, would be outside of the Christian faith, uh, though we'd love them and we would want them to, uh, and we, we would we would have great conversations and enriching conversations, I'm sure, uh, mm-hmm. with them. Uh, it would be it would be outside of orthodoxy for certain. Um, so, okay. And that's our so, view. And 100 so, years later, that's still our view. We haven't changed our theology. A couple, a couple questions in here that I wrote down. B.J. Allen at the top of uh, the hour had two questions that I'd love to a- answer, or get answered by you since, uh, I mean— you know the stuff, uh, uh, and then and then I've got questions about some of the sixteen fundamentals. So so one of them is uh, the he heard this. He said, uh, "Ag teaching and theology, the movement, etc. is it's very new in history." Uh, supposedly, uh, he even mentioned in 1901, saying that's how old it is. Uh, aren't we supposed to be like weary of like new stuff? Uh, if this is a new thing, shouldn't this be something that we're we're very cautious of? Uh, how would you respond to something like that? Well, though, I tell you what the early Pentecostals would say. There's nothing okay. new about this. We're just skipping all this uh, garbage religiosity that's crept in and corrupted. I mean, they would point to like the Reformation and go, yeah, it's, that's not over. Right. That's, that corruption still exists. And so they would say, we're going back. That's why the early Pentecostals were very, very biblical. Yeah. I will give them that they, they studied the scriptures like crazy. Uh, you know, and I still see that the, 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 Pentecostal seminary that I went to, they knew the Bible a lot better than the Presbyterian seminary. Did. They just did. They knew their scriptures better. Uh, the Presbyterians had a lot more sophisticated handle on theology and systems and all those kind of things. Context. And so they would say, no, we're not, this is not new. This is, re- this is renewed. Mm. This is going back to what it always was. We do this because the apostles did. It's not new. We are restoring, you know, to the world, what God intended in the beginning, which were the gifts of the spirit, the charismata, um, the gifts of healing, the gifts of wisdom, the gifts of tongues and all those things. And see, so would that would be their it. answer. I would have answered the question a little bit differently because I have a modern context where I have information that they didn't have, right? Like I can go back and I can look at 
uh, uh, reformers. I can look at Puritans. I can look at uh, uh, early church fathers and and uh, the patristics and the desert fathers who encountered some crazy supernatural stuff and see the scarlet thread of. I mean, even uh, Count von Zinzendorf uh, and uh, you know the the, the Moravians and uh, some of the the really supernatural stuff that we see throughout history is kind of like a continual thread of the gifts and power. Yeah. So to say, to your point, you even said there were proto Pentecostal expressions uh, across the world. So we have guys like in Wales, um, uh, Evan Roberts. You've got guys in different areas, completely unaware of one another, who are experiencing similar things. Uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, second question. This is a good book. Is, go ahead. Coming uh, with Amos Young. This is da- yeah. Can you see? Yeah. Go ahead. There this you go. is Dale Coulter and Amos Young, the spirit, the affections, and Christian tradition. Mm. And they make the argument that while there's not been a classical Pentecostal theology, you can trace a lot of the dynamics that we would call Pentecostalism. If you call them the affections, mm-hmm. they trace them through everything from Wesleyanism. You mentioned Zinzendorf back to the early Church Fathers. In different dynamics and so they do a good job of bringing theology. um you know that's the problem with the reform movement with a pietistic uh, uh uh primitive movement is they think they've got the handle on it i think as soon as god we've got to be humbled and go we didn't invent this in 1901 right i mean god may have restored some things it's like the reformers didn't invent the bible justification they just brought it back to the people of god you know yeah and I yeah. think this is the way of God bringing the gifts of the Spirit back to the people of God. It wasn't just for the Pentecostals. It was meant to be for everybody. And I think the charismatic renewal of the 60s and 70s began to demonstrate that. And what you see globally now, way outside the bounds of the Assumers of God, but but the charismata is everywhere. So this is uh, this guy said, I, I heard speaking in tongues is required to be a member of an Assemblies of God denomination. Is that accurate? It's required to be ordained as a minister. Okay. Um, yes, that is one of our 16 fundamental truths. It's interesting. Remember, they didn't want a creed, okay? Mm-hmm. They got it the same way Nicaea got it. They got it over Trinity. But then they go, what, what are we going to say about tongues? And so in number eight, they said that speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Very simple. In 1918, fascinating guy named F.F. F. Bosworth. Um, he was a Christianary Missionary Alliance guy who got baptized in the Holy Spirit directly from uh, Parham's teaching, actually. Parham came to Illinois where he was, and he was baptized in the Spirit under his ministry. Began to start churches. The thing I love about him, he pioneered a church in Fort Worth, Texas, where we both know, you're just down the street from you, in 1910, that was integrated. And he got death threats from the Klan. He didn't care. He, it was a, he was a healing evangelist, and he had an integrated Pentecostal church in Fort Worth, Texas, in the early teens. And so he was one of those 12 guys elected to the Grand Poobah of the First Assemblies of God. He was an executive presbyter. And in 1918, he said, hey, you know what? Let's look at this doctrine thing we put in there about initial evidence. I would like to say, instead of saying that speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of spirit baptism, I'd like to say that speaking in tongues is an initial evidence of spirit baptism. And so there became this discussion and he taught on it and they had little counts and uh and they decided to go with the uh the the instead of the an which would be the mm. more generous you know thing and so he very kindly he and a few others from the christian mission alliance he resigned his position and said i just can't sign on to that and i'm going to go on my way and he had this great healing ministry to these other things but i always wonder it's one of these things you know you think back wonder what would have happened if ff F. bosworth would have won because I know so many people that used to be AG, but the sticking point was, ah, it's so restrictive. You know, yeah. it is the evidence. And now if you really get into what classical Pentecostals teach that spirit baptism is, it's not about salvation. It's not about holiness. It's not about the fruits of the spirit. It's about being empowered to witness specific dynamic. And I can sign it on that basis. But I just wonder if we would have been a much bigger movement had we been more generous in that language. This is something but I I'm wonder actually... if they were just tired of fighting. Yeah. Yeah. So help me help me with this because I think this is interesting because um I, I think there is something 
Um, because I do, I would, I'd be one of those guys who go, man, uh, I don't know why pre-trib is essential. Like, I don't know why initial physical evidence is essential. Like, uh, how, can you, can you maybe answer like the question, like how many people in assemblies, do you know the percentage? I've heard stats that like, I want to say the stat I heard was somewhere in like 35% of members of assemblies, churches speak in tongues. Like it's not, it's not a universal experience for all people in the assemblies, but it's required for ordination. Is that, is that the way that that it is yeah okay. it is not required uh in anything for church attendance it's not required for membership to take communion church polity is very unique in the assemblies of god we can talk about that but there's no individual churches are sovereign so yeah. they can so i'm not going to say there's no ag church that wouldn't let you be a board member if you didn't speak in tongues mm. i'm just saying i don't know of it. gotcha um, okay so but for so ministers the, it is yeah the assemblies of god is a crazy fast-growing organization. They're doing missions all over the world. They're they're one of the right. largest denominations in America right now, so they're growing right. crazy fast. You're saying like, hey, we could have been bigger. We could have been bigger, better, faster, stronger, all those things. Maybe if we had wiggled some of these things. Can you maybe speak to us about like the... Um, the 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 lightweightness is that a, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing when talking about like the Assemblies of God doctrine? Because when I look at like yeah. uh, 1689 London Baptist Confession Baptist, like you've got a 3,000 different things you've got to agree to before you can be a 1689 London Baptist guy. But the Pentecostals, like you guys have 16 things. Like that's a that's a pretty easy yeah. uh, uh, checklist. You know, go, hey, these 16, cool. You're either on or you're out. You know, like you don't have to like spend years really kind of pulling through all of the, the, the minutia of various uh, tertiary issues. It's like, here are our essential things. We disagree on other non-essential things. So, so has that been a benefit to the movement in its growth and its spread, or has it hindered the movement in areas of like quibbling over lesser areas of, of doctrine and not having a a clear outline of what you believe on everything? Right. I I have this. This is Luther's small catechism. I've been reading through it. I'm like, that's a lot. It is the small one. Yeah. You know, we we don't. Have that. And I think it's. Would you rather be a giant battleship? You know, there's some things a battleship can do that a small you know PT boat can't do. But it can't turn very fast. Yeah. Right. It can't get in every port. It can't do. So we have chosen as assemblies of God to be very light on uh on 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 the restrictive nature of that. Mm -hmm. Some of us would like to see it be a little less restrictive. I I honestly, the the last third of our 16 funnel truths all deal with end times theology. Mm -hmm. And and I am on record of this, so I'm not gonna get in trouble. I've told my general superintendent, I wish we'd have a council to go back and look at that because. What was happening in 1914 is not what's happening today. We have different mm. views. You were talking about a time when everybody thought the world was going to end. Like yeah. dispensationalism, World War I was happening. I've got articles on, you know, <clears throat> I'm talking about COVID, of the Spanish yeah. flu from the Pentecostal evangel where they're saying, hey, guys, we're all shut down. Headquarters all shut down, but we're at home praying and reading the Bible. Oh, and also, this is clearly the end of, of the world. Let's all pray that God will give us strength, not for what may happen, but what's clearly going to happen. There's a war yeah. in the world, and there's this thing. So they were very much, I think you'd say like the early apostles. You read the text. They didn't think there was going to be three generations of this. Right. Jesus said, you're the generation. Yeah. The early Pentecostals thought the same way. So I would like to go back and look at the end times theology. Um, yeah. I agree with Amos Young. We've talked about this, that I, I think there has been say it like this, an overemphasis on our distinctive doctrine, uh, overemphasis on the tongues part mm -hmm. instead of the spirit baptism part. Mm -hmm. So I've got this wedding ring, right? And uh, it's important. But if I, my wife wants to come to talk to me and I say, hey, hey, hush, I'm shining my wedding ring. Leave me alone. What am I doing? The wedding ring is a symbol of the relationship, right? So the tongues is an initial evidence, It's, but it's not the ongoing thing. Right. So I, I do think we've overemphasized that um, as an initial evidence. I think it's handy as a gift and handy as a prayer language and handy as other things. But specifically, what and that's a whole other talk. Sure. The Pentecostals have as many words for tongues as Eskimos do for snow. You know, when we say tongues, <laughs> don't tongues, just say tongues. We're talking praying about Pauline, in the spirit. Lupin, yeah. Gloss you know. Yeah, we got it all. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think um, that dynamic has hampered us some. Overseas, you don't see that as much. Yeah. It's interesting. The grandkids of Pentecost, uh, globally, they're not as hung up on that. Um, yeah. So they, they just do the fruit, man. And they don't really worry about how specifically the vine is attached. 
Um, mm. But but again, we don't control them. That's the other beauty of Assumers of God is the indigenous principle of missions. We don't want to control anybody. So when the Assumers of God sticks to her early roots and says, hands off, we want to control you, that's when we're at our best. When we try to be like a denomination and we go, we're going to. So as a presbyter, I'm always going, guys, 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 guys. Let's go back to the early church fathers. What would they think about what we're doing? They would be, sp- I have said this on the presbytery before. Our founding fathers as God, would be spinning in their graves about this issue we're about to vote on. Yeah. And I've had them go, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. We're going to vote this down. So when we're at our best, we are a, a hands-off man. Let the, there's one Holy Spirit and I'm not him. I don't get to tell you what the Holy Spirit's doing. But what's so- the flip side of that? The flip side of that is the Holy Spirit told me there's only one Jesus. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You take the good, you take the bad, you blend them in, and there you have the facts of life. Yeah, so so we, we've talked about a little bit about initial physical evidence. We talked a little bit about um, the eschatology. Uh, we only have a few more minutes left in the show. If we're going to go by that hour time slot, we've got another five, six minutes. Could you could you explain to us the, the a la carte nature of ecclesiology that you explained to me earlier? I think that's— Beautiful. Uh, yes. I, I, I think I'm a the, fan. I think the genius of the assemblies of God. All right, listen, you've always got it, it, it's it's capturing lightning in a bottle. The lightning is the Holy Spirit. I would say, yes, we've always been a people that say, Holy Spirit, we want to know you. We want to know your will. We just want to step out and do what you're calling us to do. But the bottle is the structure and you've always got to have the structure. And so how do you capture lightning in a bottle? And I think the genius of the assemblies of God is our is our our polity and, and and our ecclesiology and so one of the benefits of being a modern movement founded in, in, in America right this is your call out a great question you know aren't you wary of things that are new yes so were Tom Adams Alexander Hamilton George Washington but they did something new mm-hmm. and it pays to be able to look at all the old things people have done and bring the best out of that so the founding fathers said we're going to take John Locke's definition of freedom and uh, uh, Jean Rousseau's definition of freedom and let them fight it out. So Pentecostal said, okay, my former pastor, he, he was a church planner, and he, it pays to write your own church bylaws. Well, it's true. It pays to write your own constitution. So we said, what do we want our structure to be? So they looked around and said, in America, there's two kinds of, of, of predominant church theology. you got a congregational model, right? Anabaptist, Baptist, congregational churches, where the power goes from the ground up. The church calls their own pastors, owns their own lands, sets their own direction, all right? Then you got a Presbyterian model where the power goes from the top down, right? It's it's the Pope, it's the Cardinal, it's the Bishop, it's the Presbyter, it goes down. And so there's some benefits to both those things, and there's some dangers to both those things. So they said, look, we can do whatever we want. Let's put the chocolate and the peanut butter together. So what they did, they said, for the churches, we're going to have a congregational structure. So in the Assemblies of God, a general council church is a sovereign church. My church can fire me and hire the next guy, and the denomination have any say in it. They can decide to build their own building and raise their own funds and buy their own property and not the denomination. So we don't have any. If, if we now want it, to lead the it, denomination, we don't have to. It cut out when you said, you said, uh, and eh, the denomination. And I want to make sure you don't get in trouble. You want to repeat what you just said as it cut, as it cut out? Where did it cut out? Uh, right as you said, we can do whatever we want and beep the denomination is what it sounded like you said. And I, I'm, I'm very oh, no, concerned don't for you. The <laughs> I'm but very the concerned for you. can't really do anything about it. Right, right. As, okay. long, as long as we don't violate our theology, those 16 fundamental truths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The church can set its own. So if the church wants to do social justice issues, they could do it. If the yeah. church wants to be expository, by the book preaching and very conservative, they can do that. But the ministers, you know, in the Southern Baptist, the ministers are ordained through the church. No, we have a Presbyterian model. So we've got mm. a general superintendent, presbytery there, district presbytery, the district level, sectional presbytery. I'm in that chain. So I am responsible yeah. to a executive presbytery in, in, for three things, with my money, with my morality, and with my theology, right? So if I get in trouble with the monies or the honeys or start teaching Arianism— they can yank me, right? So they can't. So I can't just do anything I want. There's an accountability structure. I can't take you seriously after the money and the honey. I'm like busting up over here. Believe me, I tell young <laughs> ministers all the time, guys. Two, 
mess around with the monies of the honeys. That will get you out of ministry faster it's, than anything else. It's got to be true. It rhymes. Like, that's that's typically my standard. If it doesn't rhyme, it may or may not be true. But if it rhymes, for sure true. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that's our ecclesiology. And I think it's a great blending. There's accountability, but there's flexibility. And, 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 and we have issues with that. Do you but have overall, plurality of elders healthy. in your local church? Do you have like a plurality of elders? You can. Okay. You can. Because, you, because you're I allowed to be autonomous. I system in my church Yeah. Um, because we've chosen to do that. Other churches don't. They have a traditional board structure. Mm. You can have a strong pastor structure or a weak pastor structure. It, it, the individual churches can really set a lot of what they do. That's why we say when you visited a Simmons God church, well, you visited one of Simmons God church. You cannot put us as a monolith. That's really interesting. Can we can we wrap up the show talking about that? Because yes. um, you you walk into an Assemblies of God church. I have I've done this. I've been in an Assemblies of God church where the pastor would preach, and in between saying something really good, people would stand up on the front row and blow shofars. Um, and it was like that. If that was someone's kind of, they walked in, and that was the normal, and that was it was a Spanish Assembly of God church too. So like, there's like that extra flair of like, ah, uh, yeah. it was it was yeah. it was intense, right? So so, and then you have other Assemblies of God churches where it's like, hey, like we don't practice the gifts here, but like the, we believe they exist, we just don't practice yep. them, right? So like, you've got like this, you got this wide swath of like, hey, we're gonna do it a, a times a thousand, and other groups are like, we're very cautious of those. Can you? Can you kind of speak to that, how the culture of the yeah. assemblies is actually very, very diverse? If you go to Springfield, Missouri, which is yeah. our headquarters city, and you shouldn't, no one should go to Springfield, but if you do, <laughs> you will find 50 Assemblies of God churches for 160,000 people. <laughs> On a spectrum, there you will find seeker-sensitive churches where you could be there for three years and go, I didn't know where AG. And you will find <laughs> liturgical AG churches that preach from the Pentecostal evangel, and you will find yeah. everything in between. And, and, and so there is in a populist, uh, remember, this is an American denomination. Yeah, It was founded on populism and capitalism. And so you can, we don't tell guys, if a guy wants to come in here and plant a church, I'm like, God bless you, go do it. Well, I'm going to do it this way. Fine. I'm not going to do this. Fine. Again, as long as you stay in some fairly narrow you know, they're just theological parameters. Like Sixteen fundamental truths are good, and, and you're these being three moral, moral areas. Yeah, and you're not messing with the money's money. You're all good. You're in. So I, I think there's a. Does that cause some chaos? Of course it does. Of course it does. But that's what we're Pentecostals. We're used to the chaos. Yeah. My Presbyterian brothers have this saying that everything is is proper and in order. I discovered mm -hmm. that when I was at the Presbyterian. Proper and in order. Proper and in order. Oh yeah. Yep. That yeah. is not a Pentecostal mantra, baby. It's like, mm, no. let's just go. Let's just see what God wants to do. <laughs> yeah, it's it's easier. It's that that uh, that proverb. It's easier to ask forgiveness than permission, right? Like, uh, or or that that scene in uh, in uh, Jurassic Park. You were so busy asking if you could do it, you didn't <laughs> ask if you should do it. Should be, uh, yeah. Anyway, what a great way to end a show. Jurassic and there's Park. a lot of things that some of I think we shouldn't do. I'll be clear sure. about that. <laughs> but we think God will sort it out. We got the spirit of Gamelia. If God's not, if the Holy Spirit's not in, right, it, it's not going to come to you. And hey, we'll do we'll do a part two. This has been fun. I, I think this I, I our audience fun. our audience really engages well with church history and discussing history and trying to understand denominations and these kinds of things. I, I hope to create a a very large swath of a playlist on different denominations. Like where did Lutheranism come from? And there's like three different branches of Lutheranism and and the Presbyterians and there's different branches of Presbyterians and like understanding these shifts and understanding some of these these division areas of hey. Brothers, not brothers. Hey, uh, brothers, Orthodox, uh, but we disagree with. And helping the body of Christ just kind of navigate these waters because with the consumerism yeah. that we live in today, I mean, it's it's almost impossible to figure out where do I fit, where do I where do I come in line with this? Because there's so much to choose from, and there's this kind of paralysis of analysis that uh, the postmodern era has said. Hey, if there's lots of truths, so there's no truth, and we wanna we wanna actually help show that. We actually agree on almost all of the essentials. It's the non-essentials, yeah. the tertiary issues that that Christians uh, quabble about and disagree about. And uh, those essential things, we go split on that. But those non-essential things, just to learn uh, that Christian charity and and hospitality and understanding. Okay, uh, theologically, that's that that may be wrong, but it's not heresy. And helping people place those in buckets. And I think this was helpful for that man. I really do. Good. 
Good. Cool. Well, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yeah. People who might be in your area, let them know where you're at, how they get connected with your church before we, before we sign off. Yeah, uh, SWFF.com, Southwest Family Fellowship. We're in the southwest part of Austin, Texas. Okay. And uh, you can we stream all our sermons. We just finished a God at the Movies series. Where uh, Every year for 17 years, I take movies and talk about theology through. through that. That's a, a, a popular one. But I do a lot of history and, and uh, a lot of uh, history, sociology, theology, so, and pop culture in my sermons. Am I allowed to talk about like the series you did last October? You can talk about anything you want. Why? You said, well, because you said it was Oktoberfest. That's what you guys did at your Assemblies oh, yeah, of God no, that Church. Was a few I was like, ago. yeah, oh yeah. You're the only Assemblies of God Church that did a sermon series named Oktoberfest. Only one. Now I'm close to New Braunfels and Fredericksburg. There's a large German, but I did four yeah. German theologians that changed the world. So every week I did a different one. I did Luther. Uh, I did Bart. I did. Uh, well, I did Luther, Schleiermacher, Bart, and Moltmann. And hey, here's the kicker. Michael's Our in the in the chat. Lord. That's a good idea, Michael. You should do that, bro. <laughs> Our Sorry. Were German, and we played polka music, and we had a keg of root beer, <laughs> pretzels. So we're the only Assemblies of God church I know of that has a account that's, that specs liquor, um, just for the root beer kegs. Bro, <laughs> this is so much fun for me, guys. Uh, thank you so Good. much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. We are a theology broadcast. If you like this video, make sure to hit the subscribe button. We're coming out with content just like this every week. Hey, if you watch the show regularly, you want to support us, go into the description of the video and click the Patreon link there. You can give 5 10 20 bucks a month. Uh, help supporting the content we're coming out with. We've got unique and engaging content there on Patreon. Uh, it's just extra stuff uh, uh, that, that if you're if you're really interested in who we are and want to know more about us, we've got videos on there about how our ministry started, the prophetic words that were kind of spoken over us that kind of helped launch the ministry. Uh, there's videos in there about Michael's background, how he was discipled, uh, the church that he now pastors, a little bit about him personally. Uh, we've got stories of uh, like right there in the video, uh, we've got Elijah Stevens who's up there uh, discussing with us how to discern discernment ministries. Lots of content like that on the Patreon. I would really encourage you guys to check that out. It helps support us. Uh, it helps us kind of go into a, a full-time thing. We'd love to to do that. Uh, uh, recently, just kind of a the first time we've actually announced this, uh, we, we had a donor that, that is supporting me and helping me be full-time for the next couple of months in a, in a hope that we can kind of jumpstart this thing. So I would really appreciate if you guys would give on Patreon so that we can make this a a long-term full-time thing for us over here at Remnant. So if you're so blessed by the ministry, please donate as we want to continue creating uh, the frequency of content that we are producing right now. So blessings, and uh, we'll see you guys next Monday. Hey, thank you so, so much, Anthony, for coming on. We really enjoyed it. Thanks, Josh. Blessings. Peace, guys.